21 is where we are in our series, our study here in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. And we'll look together in verse number 1. The Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, if we think about it for just a moment, a thousand years from today, all of us will be very much alive. I, I was reading a little bit about the, the autobiography of D.L. Moody. He was asked to write about his life. His son really wanted him to, to write about what God had done in his life. And D.L. Moody did not want to do it at all. Uh, he, in fact, refused uh, to write about his life. And, and he didn't want to brag about uh, anything he had accomplished in his life. He said, listen, it's, it's all to the glory of God. And um, so he, they, this family kept on pushing that he would write this, this autobiography. And finally, D.O. Mooney took a piece of paper and he wrote a couple of words. And uh, the beginning of that, that statement that he made is he said, listen, one day you're going to receive the word that D.L. Moody is dead. He said, don't believe a word of it. I will be very much alive. The Bible teaches us that after this life will come the eternal life. And as we looked at our study, we, we looked at the two resurrections, the resurrection of the, uh, the righteous and the resurrection of the unbelieving. And the Bible teaches us that that one day all of us are going to stand before the Lord. We know that, that the unsaved will stand before the Lord at the white, the great white throne judgment, we call it. And the Christian will stand before the Lord at, we call it, the Bema seat. And the, the judgment where we will stand before the Lord, not to give an account for our sins or to stand before the Lord as sinners because our sins are washed away, but as stewards of what we have done for the Lord in the time that he has allotted us upon this earth. And it's important for us to understand that we are on this earth to serve the Lord, to live with an eternal view. Uh, the Bible says it this way in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. It says, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. I believe the promises there are speaking of the, the Lord Jesus and the Savior. They had faith, believing that a Savior would come. And these Old Testament uh, you know, prophets and such, 
They believed that salvation would be provided to them by a Savior, and they believed in faith that this would take place. And the Bible says they, they believed, they all died in faith, but the Bible says not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Because this world is not our home. If this world is your home, if this world is your home, you are in big trouble. If this is your hope, then you are a hopeless individual. The Bible says that we're pilgrims, we're strangers. And all of these that died in faith embraced the truth that this world is not our home, we're just passing through. Now, most of the time, unfortunately, we as Christians get entangled with the affairs of life. Now, now a, couple of, a couple of messages ago, I, I talked about the difference between being in the world and not of the world. We are in the world. There's nothing sinful uh, about someone having a job and working hard on that job, having a career, having a home, having a car, having material things. There's nothing sinful about these things in themselves. We are in the world. And Jesus recognized that. He says, listen, you are in the world. In fact, he said, listen, if you don't provide for your own, you are worse than an infidel. But there's a big difference from being in the world to being of the world. And Jesus said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You don't think the same way as the world thinks. You are a pilgrim. You are a stranger when it comes to the things of this world. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. We could turn there to, uh, tonight. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. And notice what the Scripture says in verse Chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For our conversation, that is an old English word, it means more than, you know, it speaks more of, uh, you know, just the words you say, but it speaks of, of your life. It, it, it it's represents in this passage of Scripture, scripture here in Philippians 3.20, it speaks of your citizenship. And it says here that your, your conversation, your citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This world is not our home. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Colossae, he said this, If ye then be risen with Christ, if you're a Christian, then you are. He says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Let me ask you this question. Why is it important to set your affections on heavenly things? Does anyone know? Sorry, what's that? They last, that's true. Yeah, they last. What other reasons would it be important to set your affections on eternal things? No one's going to try. They last forever? Absolutely. What's that? Gives us hope? Yes. You, you know, when we set our affections on these things, heavenly things, that's what we're going to pursue in this life. The Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if your affection is on heavenly things, then, then if that is your treasure, then that is what you're going to pursue in your life. And, and so I, I say all of that for us to understand that, that we as believers need to you know, fundamentally understand this world is not our home. And you mentioned many things of why this is important, but... Let me just give you a couple more of why having an eternal view is important. First of all, it indicates a genuine faith in Christ. I mentioned already Luke 12, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
Secondly, an eternal view is life-changing. When we focus our attention on heavenly things, it helps us to seek those heavenly things. Thirdly, an eternal view brings us comfort in trials. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 gives us a perspective that the trials that we have on this, on this earth are, are really just a light affliction. They are just for a moment. And that it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And so if we're focused on the earthly things, if our attention is on this earth, then those trials could really harm us and hurt us and keep us from doing what God wants us to do. But if we look past those trials and we look to the Lord and have an eternal view, then they're going to have an eternal reward in our life. By the way, that's why Job kept on moving even though he lost everything. It's because he wasn't focused on this earth. He had an eternal view. Fourthly, an eternal view keeps us from sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If we are eternally minded, uh, then we are going to understand the devastation and the harm of sin. Fifthly, an eternal view keeps our eyes on serving the Lord each and every day. And, and the, Bible, the Bible actually talks more about hell than it actually does about heaven. And I think it's because it's warning people of how terrible hell is. And we all know that where Jesus is, it's going to be a wonderful place. And, uh, you know, the Bible teaches us that heaven is a, is a real place. As real as we are here tonight, heaven is a real place. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a location of where heaven is. We don't have, you know... Uh, maps, points on a map, or we don't have, you know, we don't have an exact location, but the perspective of the Bible is that heaven is always up. It's always up. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse number 2, it says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such as one caught up into the third heaven. Where the birds fly, that would be the first heaven. Where space is, that would be the second heaven. And where God dwells, that would be the third heaven. And, and, and let me say this, I, I think it's also fascinating that the Apostle Paul here, he could not tell whether he was in a physical body or a spiritual body. I mean, when we get to heaven, it's going to be like it is uh, as we are experiencing right now, yet it's going to be far, far better, of course. And yet the Bible says the Apostle Paul could not tell whether or not he was uh, in a spiritual body or a physical body. And so what we have before us here in this, this wonderful book in, in Revelation chapter 21 is we begin to look at what the Bible has to say about our final and eternal home. This is what heaven is going to be like. Uh, after the millennial reign, God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, the Bible speaks of, uh, of this wonderful place in this passage of Scripture. So if you're taking notes uh, tonight, let's look at number A or letter A, I should say. Letter A is the characteristics of the new heaven and earth. The characteristics of this new heaven and new earth. Verse number one, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The Bible teaches us that when the new heaven and the new earth is created, the old is going to pass away. The old earth will be forgotten. The woes and the sorrows, the disappointments, the hardships, of this life is going to be gone. And God is going to make all things new. All of the unbelievers, the devil, the antichrist, the false prophet, are now at this particular time cast into 
the lake of fire. And the Bible says here that God has made all things new. Let me give you some Old Testament passages of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 65, if you could turn there. Isaiah chapter 65. And notice what the Bible says in verse number 17. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse number 17. The Bible says in verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. We're not going to be in heaven dwelling on this, old, on this old earth, this old world. The Bible says it's going to be passed away. It's not going to be remembered, nor will it come into mind. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse number 22. I had someone say to me one time, you know, in heaven, are they going to look down on earth? Uh, you know, right now, are people in heaven looking down on earth? I have no idea, but why would they? <laughs> Why would they want to look at this mess when they are in the glories of God in a wonderful, perfect place? I, I mean, it wouldn't make sense to me, but uh, the Bible is not clear on those things. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22, the Bible says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. The new heaven and the new earth is not going to be this earth just made better. It's going to be completely new. I think we have to understand that. It's not just going to be what we see today made in a better way or, you know, we, we sometimes think, well, it's going to be returned back to the Garden of Eden and everything's going to be wonderful and perfect again. That's not what the Bible teaches. God is going to create everything new. And the new heaven and the new earth is going to be not old versions made new, but completely new and fresh created by God. God created this world, the world that we are on today, uh, for, for humanity's home. And we know that sin entered into the picture Genesis chapter 3, you can read about that. Sin entered into the picture, and this home became corrupted. This home became polluted. The Bible says in Job chapter 15, in verse 15, it says, Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. In Isaiah 24, in verse 5, the Bible says this, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Now, you know, as you talk to people, you're going to hear many times people are going to say something like this. They're going to say, well, if God is a loving God, then why are children dying of cancer? If God is a loving God, then why are people starving to death? If God is such a wonderful, loving God, then why is there war? Why is there COVID? Why is all of this mess happening in our world today? And the answer to, to that question or questions is the problem is not God. The problem is us. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture, Isaiah 24, 5, the earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Listen, when God created this world, He looked at everything and He said, it is very good. God created this earth in a wonderful, perfect way. And yet when sin entered into the picture, that's when the mess, that's when the mess started. And that's when the, the earth was cursed. And that's when you know, people started to become greedy and steal and thieves started to take. And we could solve the problem um, of hunger in probably about 24 hours if corporations weren't so greedy and money wasn't the bottom line. At the end of the day, listen, the problem is not God. The problem is the people on the earth. It's us. We are sinners and because of that, this earth is polluted, is corrupted. And the Bible says, let me say this, I know I mentioned this last week, but the largest change in this new earth, the Bible says, will be the absence of, of a sea. 
Um, the sea covers over 70% of our earth today, over the earth's surface. And yet the Bible says when God creates the earth new, there will be no more sea. Can anyone guess what percentage of our bodies is water? 90%. Brother Dan Poirier got it 100% correct. 90%. 90% of our bodies are, is water. And we are, we are absolutely depended on water in our world today. And yet, when we have glorified bodies, that will not be the case. We will not be dependent on water like we are today. And so the Bible says that God is going to create this world. He's going to make it all new. Uh, he, he's, going to, he's going to bring in new things. And one of the, the differences God wants us to understand is that there's not going to be a sea. There's not going to be oceans. Uh, this new earth and this new heaven is going to be recreated by God. We see letter B tonight, the city in the new Jerusalem and earth, verse number 2. And so the Bible says, and I saw, verse 2, and I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem. So this new earth is going to have to have a capital city. And this capital city is going to be New Jerusalem. And, and I believe this New Jerusalem is the heaven today that, that if we pass away from this earth, we go to be with the Lord Jesus in glory. We go to be with Him in heaven. I believe that this will be the New Jerusalem that will come down from heaven, the Bible says, and it will be the new capital city, the New Jerusalem upon this earth. And, and so from the passage of Scripture here in verse 2, we note that this city already exists. The Bible says it's coming down from God out of heaven. It's prepared, already prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so it would seem to me from this passage of Scripture uh, that heaven right now, the heaven that exists right now, when we go to be with the Lord, when we leave this earth, that it will be the capital city, the heavenly city that will descend to this earth in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 10, the Bible says this, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 10, let's take a look at this passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 10. Notice what the Scripture says in verse 10, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 10. It says, For he looked for a city. He looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. This city is a holy city because the inhabitants of the city are holy. That's speaking about you and me who know the Lord as our Savior. We have glorified bodies. We are a part of the first resurrection. We are holy because of Christ. We are righteous because of Christ. And it has become a holy city because Christ has made us holy through His salvation. And so the Bible says there's a new heaven, a new earth, completely different, completely new, created by God. No more sea. The sea is gone. And all of a sudden, John sees descending from heaven, he sees heaven itself, that, that holy city, that, that beloved city, New Jerusalem, that comes down and it formates upon that earth. And this is the capital city of this new earth. And we notice right away, let us see tonight, the celebration in the new heaven and earth. The Bible says it's as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, we think about that expression, a bride that is prepared for her husband. We think about the celebration of togetherness. The celebration of togetherness. And, and at a wedding, we come and we celebrate the coming together of a, of a man and a woman. This is God's design and God's plan. And we celebrate that work of Almighty God and and the Bible says here in this passage of Scripture that there's a celebration, and it's a celebration of the togetherness of God and men. God and those who know Him as Savior. And the Bible says over and over again, and you see it in this passage of Scripture, 
Over and over again, it says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God, and I'm going to dwell with you. I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be with you. And there's that celebration in heaven because in a physical sense, and I understand that Jesus is with us in a spiritual sense. He indwells us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. I understand that we can pray and, and that when we pray, He hears our prayer. I also understand that, that Jesus is the Word, and the Word we have in our hands is powerful, and He talks to us through His Word. But yet, in a physical sense, Jesus is going to be with us, and He's going to dwell with us, and He is always going to be there. Look what the Bible says in verse 3. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, The tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. A great celebration. What is being celebrated in this passage of Scripture. Well, first of all, right away, there's the celebration that God will be with us. The thought there of a tabernacle is a tent or a dwelling place. Now, at Christmas time, we celebrate uh, God came to us, right? God came to us. And at this particular time, the celebration is that God will be with us in a physical way, He will pitch His tent among His people. That's what the Bible is saying here. And He is going to be with us. And He is going to dwell with us. He is going to be our God. And we will be His people. This is such an incredible sign. That we will be with the Lord. See, I believe this. I don't believe that when you get to heaven, you're just going to know everything. I know there are people who believe that and And they just believe that, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to know all the woes of my life and I'm going to know all the reasons why those things happen. And all these things are just going to, you know, just be revealed to me. And and I don't think that's going to be the case because, uh, and, and the evidence I have from Scripture is that when you look at the martyrs in the book of Revelation, they were asking the Lord how long. They did not know when He would avenge them. Now, here's, here's the thing. You're not going to have all the answers. You're not going to be all-knowing. We're not going to be God. We're going to be with God. At the end of the day, Jesus will be with us. And so if you have any questions, you can go directly to the Lord and say, Jesus, I was thinking, why did these things happen in my life? Why did this take place? Now you might say, well, the Bible says the former things will be passed away and we won't have any even thoughts about our our life on the earth. And that may be the case. Our questions may be answered because we won't have any desire to even know about it because heaven will be so wonderful and the presence of Jesus will be there. But at the end of the day, it is just an incredible thought that God will be with us and He'll dwell with us And it says here we're celebrating this togetherness of God and humanity that we are are finally in a physical sense. We are together. His people is with Him. We see number two, God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Now, again, there's lots of speculation from this passage of Scripture. People say, well, why are we crying? We're in heaven and God's wiping away all our tears. Why are we crying? And There are some who believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to look around and see people who are are not there. And we're going to cry. And God's going to come and comfort us and wipe our tears away. I think that the expression here, that God will wipe away all of our tears from our eyes, I just believe that the thought is that in heaven, there's not going to be anything to be sorry about. That, That we're with the Lord and we're in the presence of Jesus that that feeling of sorrow and that feeling of sorry that we experience in our emotions on this earth will all be gone because we are going to be in the presence of Jesus. The Bible says in Isaiah 25 and verse number 8, it says He will will swallow up death and victory. 
And the Lord God will wipe away tears off from off our faces, and the rebuke of His people shall He take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. All of that sorrow that, that we experience on this earth will not be a part of this wonderful place in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, I love this, the Bible says there'll be no more death. There'll be no more death in verse number four. The great consequence for our sin is gone. And the Bible says that, that death will, will be passed away, that there'll be no more death. God will, will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. Verse number four, the Bible says there'll be no more sorrow, no more mourning, no, no more crying, no, no more sorrow that we'll experience. The grief that life brings and the difficulty of life and all the sorrow that we've experienced on this earth, it won't be a part of heaven. Broken hearts, tears, heartaches will not exist in this new Jerusalem. No more sorrow, God says. Number five, no pain. No pain. I'm 41 years old. I'm getting older every year. We all do. And I know there's some older than me. I understand that. But the older we get, the more pain we experience. Am I not right? The reality is we face, we face pain in this earth. And not just, listen, not just physical pain. Emotional pain. And the Bible says all pain, physical pain, emotional pain, all of it will be gone. In fact, the Bible says that the former things are passed away. Everything that is connected to the old world and the curse will be gone forever, the Bible says. And God will make all things new. Verse 5, look what the Bible says here. It says in verse 5, And He sat upon the throne and said, Behold, I love this, I make all things new. This, is, this really is an incredible declaration because it, it is the work of God. I make all things new. And he said unto me, so now he speaks here to John. He says, John, write those things. Write for, uh, excuse me, write for these words are true and faithful. What, what is he writing down? That one expression I make all things new. Let me ask you this question. When you think about the book of Revelation, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What is the book of Revelation about to you? Because for a lot of people, if you say the book of Revelation, you know the first thing that comes to their mind? 666. And, and, and really, that's all the book of Revelation means to them, is an antichrist, a false prophet, and that's, that's what gets the most attention. In fact, I, I would say that as far as sermons in the book of Revelation, that the, the antichrist gets far more attention than Revelation chapter 20 and chapter 21. But friend, listen to me. At the very beginning of this study, the Bible reveals for us that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not the revelations of John. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And all of these events take place. And yes, don't misunderstand me. All of the Bible is important. And, and when it talks about the Antichrist, it's important. And when it talks about the false prophet, it's important. And all the things that are going to come to pass in, in, the, in the, uh, the new government of the Antichrist. Yes, I understand all of these things. But really, the book of Revelation is all about chapter 20 and 21 and 22. The, yeah, we had to go through a lot of things to get to this point. But now, Jesus is revealed as the rightful King. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And we are with Him, His people. 
And we are dwelling with him. And the Bible says that God says, listen, I have made all things new. When I think of that passage of Scripture, when I think of that that phrase in our Bible, I, I think of the phrase when the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Because that's what God does. Behold, I make all things new. As I mentioned last week, God didn't just fix up our sinful nature. He gave us a divine nature. He gave us a a new nature. And so we find in verse number 5, these words, I make all things new. This is true. These will come to pass. And John is told to write them down because the one on the throne declares the importance of of this phrase, I make all things new. We're going to see letter D, the citizens of the new heaven and earth. The Bible says in verse 6, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right away when I read this this scripture, what sticks out to me is the expression, it is done. When Jesus was on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Redemption is complete. The payment for the world's sin is completed. And here, this redemption that Christ completed on the cross, this new heaven, this new earth, we dwelling with Almighty God, He being our God, we being His people, and this togetherness, the work is complete. Because the one that started history is also the one that's going to finish it. Because history is just His story. (laughs) It's just His story. And the Bible says in this passage of Scripture that that it is done. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning of time. I am the end of time. I make all things new. We notice the citizens of this new creation. The Bible says, first of all, it's the one that thirsts. It's the one that thirsts. The one that recognizes their spiritual need. If you are really thirsty, I mean... Isn't it amazing how much water you can consume when you're thirsty? I, I, was, I was on a, a, a special diet and I was required in the diet to drink a certain amount of cups of water every day. And, and when you're staring at a glass of water and you're not thirsty, it, it's, it's hard. It's a task. But you go out and play some hockey or you go out and play some baseball, or you go out and run around the neighborhood a couple of times and then come back and look at that glass of water, and it doesn't seem to be a task anymore. Because the difference is the thirst. And and the Bible says here that those who are a part of the the family of God or a part of of this new creation, this new heaven, this new earth, are those who recognize their spiritual need. The Bible says it this way in Matthew 5 and verse 6. Jesus said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isaiah 55 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, O everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that have no money, come ye by and eat. Yea, come by wine and milk without money and without price. And this illustration 
that we find in the Bible of this, this individual that is thirsting is an illustration of someone who has a need and they come to God for that need to be met. The Bible says this, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And, and what is the promise? They shall be filled. Because when someone recognizes their need, and God being the one that can only meet the need, God is going to meet the need. And the Bible says in this passage of Scripture that they are those who are, who are searching and seeking and they understand that they have a need and God is the one that meets that need. And they come to God for that need to be met. That is what heaven is all about. Heaven is not filled with people patting themselves on the back thinking they've accomplished anything. We've accomplished nothing in heaven. It is through Christ that we got there. Christ did the work. And heaven is filled with those who understand that they are a spiritually needy people. It was the Lord Jesus speaking to uh, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a religious man. And he came to Jesus by night because he didn't want any of his co-workers to know he was talking to Jesus. And he asked Jesus how, how to go to heaven. How can I go to heaven? And what did Jesus say? He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, what does that mean? Do I have to be born of my mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, Nicodemus. That which is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that which I say unto thee, ye must be born again. You see, Nicodemus, you don't have a physical need. You have a spiritual need. And the only way you can solve a spiritual problem is a spiritual solution. You must be spiritually born again. And that's where we get the most wonderful verse in our Bible in John 3.16 when Jesus speaking to Nicodemus said, for God so loved the world that he gave. What is he saying? Well, look at the context. He's saying, I met that spiritual need. I gave my life so that you, or I will give my life so that you could have eternal life. You had a need. I'm meeting that need. And so all that are in heaven are they that are thirst. They understand that only God can meet the need. Jesus answered and said unto her in John chapter 4, you know the story, the woman at the well, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him uh, shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life because God has met our need. And lastly, and I'll close right here, it is those who are uh, overcomers, the one that overcomes. The Bible says it's those who thirst, and it's also those who are overcomers. You say, well, does that mean that we have to be really good people and that we have to overcome and we have to get to the very end? No, that's not what the Bible says at all, because the Bible is its best commentary. And if we're going to understand what the Bible says, we need to use the Bible to help us to understand that. And so right away, we go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4. And the Bible simply says this, for, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible is filled with those who are overcomers. And they're not overcomers because they accomplished anything. They are overcomers because they have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We sing the hymn, Faith is the Victory. And it truly is, if your faith is in Christ, it truly is the victory. We're talking about being born again. This is what it means to be an overcomer. The Bible says this, they will inherit all things. It speaks, of course, of their position in Christ as a son, their inheritance. This is the inheritance that Peter talked about 
when he said, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, it is reserved in heaven for you. He's talking to believers, by the way. That's a wonderful verse of assurance right there. Reserved in heaven for you. That means it's waiting for you. A reservation is made for you. And you won't miss that reservation because God has made it and God will always keep his promise. What a wonderful blessing as we think of heaven. And, and we're going to continue to look through this and, and what the Bible has to say about the new Jerusalem as we bring the book of Revelation 